Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming, dear guests, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us today here at the Liszt Institute Hungarian Cultural Center uh, who kindly host our event today and a special thank and welcome to those who chose to join us uh, online. Uh, today's event is to commemorate uh, in association with UNESCO the 100th anniversary of the death of uh, Vilma Hogonai, the first Hungarian female uh, physician. Vilma Hugonai is a symbolic figure for Hungarians, a symbolic figure of women's equality in Hungary. The first Hungarian woman to become a medical doctor who had to study medicine in Switzerland, and I'm very happy to welcome the Swiss ambassador to UNESCO here. So she was forced to study medicine in Switzerland simply because in the late 19th century in Hungary, women were not allowed to study at universities uh, uh, at that time. And even after having received her first diploma in medical sciences in 1879, when she returned to Hungary, for two decades, the Hungarian authorities refused to recognize her medical qualifications on the same legal grounds that prevented her from studying in Hungary. Vima Hugonai's relentless struggle for the recognition of her medical qualification, her fight for women's voting rights and girl education, as well as her achievement in public health education left a huge legacy, a huge legacy that is timely and relevant for us even today in the 21st century. Today's event is a roundtable discussion with the participation of outstanding Hungarian scientists who live and work in Paris or around Paris in France. And it is moderated by Ms. Gabriel Ramos, Assistant Deputy Director General, uh, Assistant Director General of the UNESCO, uh, by evoking the historic example of Vilma Hugonai, the discussion will try to capture cross-cutting issues uh, related to the issue of uh, women in science and offer personal perspectives uh, from those who are most directly involved. I would also like to draw your kind uh, attention to the installation around uh, the hall here and then behind you, presenting the outstanding life and work of Vilma Hugonai. We are grateful to the Semmelweis Museum for Medical History uh, for providing this installation, which will be showcased at UNESCO headquarters too, on Salle des Actes from tomorrow uh, until the 1st of July. Today's event is co-organized by the Union of Hungarian Women. Uh, and now, without further ado, uh, do, I would like uh, to ask Mrs. Uh, Margit Batyanyi Schmidt to get on stage and uh, give us some uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Your Excellency, Madam President, dear distinguished guests, honorable attendees, my sword is science, my shield is the sword. This quote has been chosen as the motto of the year for the honor of Hugonai 100th anniversary. We tend to over, overestimate our own age. What does that come from? Perhaps we assign too much importance to ourselves and the time we spend on the challenge we call our life. In 2020, there has been a pandemic. In 2022, there is a war going on in Eastern Europe. On the 11th of March, at the opening press conference of Hugonai 100 in Budapest, I concluded my speech with the following sentences. I don't know how the next month will turn out, but the most important thing is to do our job with our own sword and shield. Life is strange. Many people in Europe today actually do it with swords and shields. In our case, besides our post potential and given opportunities, I would like to reflect on our feelings, our social responsibility, and the kind of cooperation that made today's event possible. I am confident that we will be able to attain the events we have planned for 2022 in Budapest, in the countryside, and in even in Paris, as part of the Hugonai 100 event series. 
And now, today, we are here. I'm grateful that we can commemorate and pay tribute. Countess Vilma Hugonai played a pioneering role, directly and indirectly, in making this possible today, the first Hungarian female physician who fought fiercely for women's equality and equal participation in education. Of course, it is not only her that we acknowledge, but all the outstanding and accomplishment of women far ahead of their time. Allow me to outline in a few words the background of today's event. The Hungarian National Commission for UNESCO has proposed the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the death of Vilma Hugonai, the first Hungarian female physician, for the joint commemoration with UNESCO in 2022. On the 11th of March, we had our op opening event, where representatives of the Hungarian National Committee of UNESCO, the Ka Maria Kopp Institute, the Semmelweis Medical History Museum, Library and Archives, the National Directorate General for Hospitals, the Foundation for Health Visitors, and the Association of the Hungarian Midwives signed a cooperation agreement. Some of them are present today. Please welcome. I would like to show you that who is the member of the Hungarian delegation. We just arrived yesterday. So first of all, Dr. Benedek Varga, director of Semmelweis Museum, Library and Archives of the History of Medicine. <laughs> Mrs. Katalin Cipan, member of the Hungarian National Committee for UNESCO who submitted the proposal to UNESCO as chairperson of the former Committee of Education. Mrs. Mariana Várfalvi, president of the Foundation for Health Visitors. <laughs> Dr. Ivon Severini, ambassador of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. <laughs> Mrs. Silvia Mayer Biziek, Descendant of Vilma Hugonai. <laughs> and Emmy Bizek, who in addition to being a descendant too, is also a composer. <laughs> Emmy was inspired, Emmy was inspired by the character of Vilma Hugonai before the event started. She performed three pieces on the piano for us today. Thank you. Let us return to the programs. On 25th of March, on the 100th anniversary of Hugonai's death, a wreath laying ceremony was held in the Fiumei Road National Graveyard, organized by the National Heritage Institute and the Union of Hungarian Women Association. We also filled roundtable discussion and thematic forums to bring this controversial era alive to make it easily understandable and accessible. A few days ago, on International Widows' Day, we had the opportunity to take a guided tour of the graves of our nation's great women, including Vilma Hugonai. Furthermore, we had the honor to have an apposite about Vilma Hugonai in the Media Services and Support Trust Fund M5 channel in a series called Hugonai, uh, Hungarian Women launched in January, besides presenting the life, character, and activities of Margaret Schlachta, Theresia Brunswick, Saint Margaret of the Arpad dynasty, Antonia Zicci, to mention just a few well-known names, Vilma Hugonai was also presented in this prestigious series. In a few minutes, we will show you a short edited version of this documentary. We have 100 years of death. To pay off, said Miklos Réthelyi, the president of the Hungarian National Committee for UNESCO at the opening event. But who was Vilma Hugonai exactly? We know unfairly little about her, even though her spirit, her work, her responsibility for women sets an example to follow. Even in today's challenging times, days, dates, stories, a doctor's diary, records, newspaper articles, that's all we have left. But what is more important in this message she conveys to us? What feel today in this strangely upside down world? 
How our history has been is being shaped by her story. Her life, her activity is embodied in each of her indirect descendants, individually and collectively. Her ideas, her ideas, ultimately, her spiritual, intellectual imprint are with us here at this moment. But how exactly is she present with us? She has not had an easy life. She had to have to, she had to have the sword and the shield that I have mentioned several times, science and work, which remain in disputable values today. Today's commemoration, today's roundtable discussion is about what Vilma Hugonai has to say to the female scientists who are working with us, for us, for our present and our future. The roundtable discussion will address cross-cutting issues and offer personal perspectives related to the role of women in science, as well as education and scientists, scientific careers outside one's home country, thus evoking the example of Vilma Hugonai. To me, as a woman, as a mother, as a leader of NGOs, as a member of many prestigious European and international professional organizations, she conveys the following message. We must take our share. Let us do it with all our physical, mental, and spiritual skills, talents, and abilities, as Vilma Hugonai did. As I have already mentioned, we can be grateful to Wilma Hugonai, grateful as a woman, as a mother, as a doctor, as a human being. I believe and I acknowledge that the value of the life's journey is not primarily in its material fulfillment. Rather, it is that we all take with us something of the thought and spiritually that Wilma Hugonai represented. We take it with us and pass it on to their present and future generations. All of us, by joining forces and working together at national, European, and even international level. Union of Hungarian Women Association, the UNESCO Paris, the Hungarian National Committee, the Semmelweis Medical History Museum Library and Archives, the Foundation for Health Visitors, the Maria Kopp Institute, Demography and Families, Family Friendly Hungary Center, the National Di Directorate General for Hospital, the Association of Hugo uh, Hungarian Midwives, the National Heritage Institute, and others, all of whom have made it possible to dedicate this year to Countess Vilma Hugonai. In the same way, you will take it, it with you the speakers, the presenters, the guests at the round table, as well as all around the present guest. Our challenge is therefore eternal. I believe that we are responsible for our own choices. There is not always complete consensus from all sides. However, the freedom of choice is in our hands and remains a great treasure. Countess Vilma Hugonai made her choice that determined to carry her plan through countless obstacles and resistance. 100, 150 years ago, which is not a long time, only five, six generations, but at the same time, 100, 150 years is a long time indeed. It is a matter of perspective. In addition to the domestic and international civil society, the importance of multilateral relation is thus enhanced because our task and mission, and mission is a serious social responsibility. Countess Vilma Ugonai was the first female physician involved in a process that continues to this day. I deliberately do not use the, the word struggle or fight because it must be a natural and long overdue process for any such activity to restore balance in the world. Hugonai had her own way. As I quote Kant Lajos Batyányi, viam meam persecutus sum. If we all work with this courageous determination of Vilma Hugonai, with her passionate commitment, with knowledge and work, meaning the sword and the shield, we will all find our own paths. 
Thank you all for your contribution to the beauty of this day, and thank you all for taking a piece of Countess Wilma Hugonai's inspiration with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President, for for these, uh, uh, these remarks. Uh, and next is my privilege to welcome Ms. Gabriela Ramos, uh, Assistant Director General of UNESCO, responsible for uh, human and social sciences, uh, who further to moderating today's roundtable discussion, also kindly accepted our invitation uh, to deliver some opening remarks. She is Assistant Director General, responsible for social and human sciences, and as such oversees uh, the organization's contributions to build inclusive and peaceful societies, including the achievements of gender equality and women in science in particular. So she is best placed to be with us today, for which we are very grateful. So Assistant Director General Zigi Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador, and, and thank you, Ambassador Reset Kunz. I am happy to see you here. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm really delightful just to, to know that there is a union for Hungarian women. Fantastic. I would love to hear more from that because what we, what we are uh, aiming here, and I see many friends from, uh, from UNESCO and also from the OECD, what, what we are aiming here is to, is to learn from each other, to see how much the experiences of somebody so impressively uh, inspiring as Vilma Ogonai uh, can, can teach us how to navigate the, the current challenges that continue to be exactly the same. If you think about it, and, and we are talking now about a, a woman that had to go to another country to pursue her dreams in terms of uh, what she wanted to be, that came back to her country and wait for 25 years, a peu près, no? Uh, to, to really uh, become what she wanted. Uh, and then that uh, at the end, well, uh, she is recognized as one of the trailblazers, no, in Hungary and in the world. Uh, but I wish we, we should not have been talking about the first women always. I'm the first, uh, no, prime minister. I'm the first chemistry. I'm the first, I'm the first. I hope that there will be generations and generations. But for the time being, I'm very pleased that we are here celebrating her 20 years, exactly, uh, in terms of, uh, of her achievements. And, uh, and of course, our panelists uh, that we will be discussing with you, because at the end, we also need these role models. We need the role models that inspire, that, uh, that can tell us. Of, of course, we have the, the granddaughter, uh, but uh, at, the, at the end, that for all of us, men and women that believe in gender equality, that we find these experiences telling on how we can move this agenda forward. Uh, and it's not easy because uh, we, we were discussing this uh, before uh, coming to the stage. It seems always that we give one step forward and some steps back. <laughs> uh, we are at the moment where, where some girls are not allowed to go to school anymore in one specific country, but there are many other countries that uh, have also some limits. We are at a moment where uh, some rights that were granted in terms of uh, deciding on our own body is being taken away in a, in a very advanced economy, democratic economy. We're not talking about some uh, kind of uh, uh, developing or, or low income with, the, with many problems that we're facing in the development world, but this is happening right now. And we are, I mean, I just came from, uh, I'm not gonna name countries, <laughs> it's not the case now, uh, but you will know uh, what am I talking about because there are some countries, many, that consider that uh, rape uh, within the uh, marriage is not a crime. And therefore, again and again and again, violence committed dom domestically have lower crime penalties than if it was committed outside the house. And therefore, I feel that uh, in that score, we have a lot, a lot to go. But in terms of science, which is, which is now what we're talking about, I, I feel that we are, have made a lot of progress. At least we are not prevented from pursuing the careers that we want to pursue. And we have many examples of uh, girls that are choosing to go into male-dominated uh, disciplines and, and advancing their, their, their careers. However, even if they go into that, the environment, once they reach the labor market or the scientific communities, is not the same. And, the, and therefore, the question is, how do we level the playing field? 
We know that uh, uh, women that do uh, research, and here we will be uh, talking with our, our speakers, have fewer op opportunities than their male counterparts, smaller labs, less equipment, less networking, probably less funding opportunities. And then we always fall into the question, is that women we ask for less funding, or is just that we are women and we are granted less funding? What is one or the other? I don't know. But the, the fact is that, that those things happen, not only in terms of research in general. It's well proven that the financial sector behaves in that way. I'm very impressed that Hungary has now 53% of doctors, which is higher than the, than the OECD countries. And I'm sure that she has uh, something to do about it. Um, but at the end, uh, the truth is that we saw it with COVID. Uh, women are re overrepresented in the health sector, but overrepresented in the nursing and the patient care kind of activities, and less represented uh, in the in the decision making uh, committees, less represented in the decision making in the health systems. And I think that this is something that we really need to take a look. Of the more than 600 Nobel me medals awarded in scientific disciplines, 23 have gone to women. And this on the representation mirrors that of women employment in this field. We still have the numbers. And, and I have been ambassadors, how long have we been in the OECD and then in the, in the UNESCO looking at the progress, progress. And progress is there, but the reality is that we still have not equality in terms of women represented in STEM, women represented in science and some scientific disciplines, and, and women, of course, represented in engineering. Um, in, in, in UNESCO, we just got this fantastic uh, uh, outcome in November uh, last year. The General Conference adopted the, the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And the fact is that if you think that uh, women or girls choose less the STEM careers than they should, they are even less represented in artificial intelligence and ITC. And this is not because of their choice, it's not because they feel that they are less able, it's just because of the environment that since the very early years reproduced these messages, no? that women might not be the best in maths, that that's not a discipline for women. And therefore, this is very important that we also work not only in the very specific tools that we have, policy or investment tools that we have to e favor women participation in these sectors, but that we also change mentalities. And this is one of the programs that we have in, our, in, our, uh, uh, in my sector, in the social and human science sector, because the fact is that uh, it comes to what women believe they should, they are good at doing, and what men believe they are should are, are good at doing, and how we they reproduce these messages. And sometimes it's just out of care. You don't want your girl to go and suffer with these engineer fabrics industries that are not. I, I have to tell you that my father is an engineer, <laughs> and when I was going to study my career, he said you should be an engineer. And I said, no, I'm going to social sciences. <laughs> and he said, What's, what a waste. I don't think it was a waste. But the fact is that this encouragement, this message of encouragement to our girls, do whatever you want to do, but go and do it, I think is really important. There are even examples of how much there are different stages of obstacles. Once the, 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 the girl choose certain discipline that is male dominated, then getting into the labor market is another hurdle. Remaining in that labor market or in that uh, industry is another hurdle, and I think you go on and on, and then you look at the leaky pipeline, all of these things that I feel still remain with us. So the whole question here is how do we advance gender equality that is uh, stays for once and for all? How do we ensure that all these policies that countries like Hungary and many others in uh, UNESCO and in the OECD have adopted to level the playing field in terms of burden sharing of the care economy, in terms of recognizing these biases and try to level it down in trying to encourage more women into science and to, and to pursue scientific careers. How do we ensure that they stay for long and that we no longer are encountering these messages and these environments that are preventing women because at the end we're losing women and we're losing the voice of, we of women, the ideas of women into building much better solutions for the challenges we face. So this is a message I will not go longer because uh, we are a little bit, uh, bit uh, um, uh, behind. I, I want just to say that uh, the, the, the numbers I have mentioned, I took it uh, from the Women in Science program of UNESCO. You know that that's uh, one of the most uh, iconic 
programs, uh, the L'Oreal Prize that we just granted uh, yesterday um, or the day before, uh, the, the, the week before, um, uh, several prizes for women participating in, in these positions. Uh, we also have um, the 2017 recommendation on science and scientific research. And this recommendation, again, include one chapter on gender equality. Of course, the main message is that we need more science. And in a context in which when science is also being uh, neglected or, or despised or, or with the misinformation and the, and the lack of uh, evidence uh, that is uh, percolating in many decision makers' circuits, it's very important that we continue to push for science and scientific research and evidence-based uh, decision making. And in this recommendation on science and scientific researchers, we are talking about these issues, but also in getting more women at the table. Uh, we are going to launch, linked to the ethical uh, recommendation on artificial intelligence, a Women for Ethical AI network that is very close to, to a wonderful experience that uh, I had with my country, I'm a Mexican, uh, in which we said, how can we um, inspire girls? Because if you go there and you go for a very learned academic message, girls are going to disconnect in three seconds and go and do something else. And what we did was just to look uh, for role models. And here we have some uh, women role model uh, that were successful Mexican women in STEM, in science, in research, that go to talk to girls. But go to talk to girls not from the altitude of the scientific research, but just to share with them that is possible, that is feasible, that you can do it, and that is fun. I think it's super important that we tell girls that science is fun and that we can get results that will address the challenges we face, but at the end, that you can feel that you're making a contribution and that you're enjoying your life. This is super important, and let me tell you, it was amazing because we come with these uh, role models, we call it the mentors, that go there and tell them, well, I'm an astronaut, and of course the girls are looking at them like, why is she talking to me? Well, no. And at the end, they get so excited about this program. So I feel we really need to ensure that we also change the mindset and that we advance these uh, important experiences for, for girls. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to be here with this fantastic icon. Uh, I think that, uh, can you imagine 1847? I mean, she was born in 1847. It's just amazing. In 1922, uh, uh, she, she left us. And I feel that uh, we all owe a lot of respect, a lot of uh, great, great uh, we need to be grateful for, for these amazing uh, women that came before us and that fought for their dreams, but at the same time, they opened the door for many other women that, that, that follow. So great to be here again. Thank you, Ambassador. And I guess we will just uh, proceed with the, with the panel. Thank you so much. Before the panel itself, uh, a 10 minute uh, video to be showcased uh, on the outstanding life of Ogone to better introduce uh, her life and legacy to all of you. So if I can ask you to turn down the light and start the screening. Attention to the screen, everyone. It's a, sh it's a short nine minute video. Fogonnai Vilma nagy tépényben született 1847. szeptember 30-án. Egy tehetős, grófi família ötödik gyermekeként nevelkedett a hat gyermekes családban. Egy hatalmas kastélyban élt a népes család, ahol a gyerekekhez egy német házi tanító járt minden nap. A kis Vilma kedvenc elfoglaltsága az olvasás és a babázás volt. Mindig orvososat, Kórházas dit játszott velük. Alig volt tíz éves, amikor a világra nyitott önálló kislányt szülei a Pesti Prepsel Mária leánynevelő intézetbe küldték, ahol minden évet osztály elsőként zárt. Tanulmányait itt be is kellett volna fejeznie, ugyanis Magyarországon ebben az időben a lányok nem tehettek érettségi vizsgát, és nem tanulhattak tovább felsőoktatási intézményben. Vilma orvos szeretett volna lenni, ami akkoriban 
teljességgel elérhetetlen álomnak bizonyult. 18 évesen a társadalmi elvárásnak eleget téve férjhez ment Szilasi György földbirtokoshoz és vidékre költöztek. Két fiúk született, akiket Vilma egy dajka segítségével nevelt, így édesanyaként is jutott ideje a könyvtárban olvasni. A Pesti Egyetemen, tehát a Pesti Tudományi Egyetemen, ami az országnak az egyeteme volt, és amikor itt létezett az ország egyetlen orvoskor még ekkor, itt nem folyt nők, nőknek a képzés egyáltalán. És akkor Hugonai Vilma megtudta 1870-es éveknek a végén, hogy a Czürichi Egyetemen ezzel szemben tanítanak nőket, akkor hát nagy lelkesen elutazott Czürichbe. Ez egy komplikált dolog volt szintén, hogy a férjétől engedély kellett kérni, a férjének el kellett őt engednie, a férje nem volt hajlandó anyagilag támogatni, minek következtében az, az életemi évei azok elég komoly nélkülözésben teltek el. És tulajdonképpen csak így tudott mondjuk orvosi pályára lépni, hogy külföldi életemre ment el. Hazajött, tisztviselőtelepen, amit most újra úgy hívnak, vásároltak egy egyszintes házat kertel, és ott kitette a táblát, hogy pába. És onnantól 17 évig nem tudott még orvosként dolgozni, mert Magyarországon kérvény-kérvény hátán adta be, és sorban még a császárhoz is bekerült a kérmény, és az is elutasított. Biztos, hogy nagyon sokan ezt abba is hagyták volna, ezt a harcot, mert ez egy harc volt, hogy de igen, ő diplomával rendelkezik, és őt hagyják gyógyítani. A 880-as évek végén találkozott egyébként a hivatásából kifolyólag a későbbi férjével, aki Varta Vince. Varta Vince a páciense volt korábban, kisebb problémával, és Ebből aztán egy nagy, nagyon jó kapcsolat lett. Ugye Varta Vince kémikus volt, a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia tagja, tehát abszolút ebben a tudományos világban dolgozott és működött, és ugye számunkra, mint hogy az Iparművészeti Múzeum egyik épületében ülünk, ugye azért fontos Varta Vince, mert ő együtt dolgozott a Zsolnai gyárral, és a Zsolnai gyárban kémikusként ő az egyik, egyik kialakítója, feltalálója tulajdonképpen az Eozin Máz vegyületének. Eddig is voltak nekünk ilyen nagyasszonyokkal foglalkozó események, úgymond évek és hogy tematikák. És először kezdtük Árva Betlenkatával, majd a Gróf Zicsi Antóniával, majd Zrínyi Ilonával, és ebben az évben pont a századik évforduló alkalmából Gróf Hugonai Vilmára emlékezünk. Ez egy közös megemlékezés az UNESCO-val együtt, és ezt az évet mi erre szánjuk. Március 11-én jelentettük be ezt az évet, akkor volt a Szemmelweis Orvostörténeti Múzeumban és Levéltárban, egy sajtótájékoztató, ahol egy ilyen platformot is alakítottunk olyan szervezetekkel, akik pont ezt a Hugonai Vilmának a szellemiségét, filozófiáját megélik a mindennapokban. Itt például partnerünk volt a Kincs, Kopmária Intézet, a partnerünk volt a, a múzeum maga, Partnerünk volt a védőnőkkel foglalkozó civil szervezetek, szülőnőkkel foglalkozó civil szervezetek. Majd március 25-én pedig a, a Fiumei sírkertben a Nemzeti Örökség Intézettel együtt megkoszoroztuk a sírját. Hugonai Vilma hát megelőzte a korát, pontosan azzal, hogy ő már abban a korban, most itt a 19. századról beszélünk második feléről, hogy abban a korban nem igazán volt lehetőség arra, hogy, az, hogy a nők tanuljanak, nem csak hogy felsőoktatás, hanem abszolút a középiskolai tanulmányokat sem folytathatták. El kellett mennie Magyarországról, hogy egyetemen tanulhasson. Hogy tanulni mert, először is bátorsága volt, hogy, hogy elment külföldre és tanult, beszippantotta 
a tudást. Ha már önmagában, akkor nem volt még téma ez a női egyenjogúság, meg hogy ezért való úgymond küzdelem. Pont példát mutatott más hölgyeknek is, hogy mit lehetett. És amikor hazajött Magyarországra a diplomájával, meg hát ott is dolgozott, nem fogadták el, és ez is egy nagyon nehéz idő volt, hogy elfogadják, és addig is ő ápolónőként vagy szülésznőként dolgozott, és önmagán túllépve, hogy ő tette a dolgát, hogy másoknak segítsen. Azért kiemelném, hogy a 19. század végén, vagy a 20. század elején neki azért jobb volt, a nagyobb lehetőségei volt, mint más nőknek, mert hogy azért itt egy, egy, egy grófi, családról beszélünk, ahol tényleg könyvtár volt mögötte, ott azért volt, voltak ezek nagyobb lehetősége volt, mint egy akár egy polgári származású hölgynek. Ha a Hugonai Vilma most itt lenne és látna, hogy a nők szabadon tanulhatnak és orvosok lehetnek és tanárok Igen. lehetnek, ő mit szólna ez büszke lenne rá és érezni, hogy ez ott indult el tőle, mit szólna ez a mai világhoz? Hát szerintem roppant büszke lenne. Szerintem roppant büszke lenne és ugye azért azt hozzá kell tenni, hogy valójában ténylegesen elképzelhetetlen Hugonai Vilmának az akaratere, az elszántsága, a kitartása nélkül. Az, hogy orvos nők vannak közöttünk. És, és én nem tudom a statisztikai arányokat, de azt hiszem valamivel több most már az orvos nem, mint az orvos az orvosi pályákon. Ez nyilván pályáktól függően változik. És, de így kerek a világ, tehát tulajdonképpen az ember inkább azt érti meg nehezen, ez miért nem volt így korábban. Tehát a világ úgy kerek, hogy a nők meg a férfiak egyenlőek, és ki jobb, azt teszi hozzá. Hugonnai Vilma álhatatossága, határozottsága és merészsége miatt minden ember példaképe lehet. Legyen az kislány, kisfiú vagy éppen felnőtt ember. Participants of the panel uh, to come on stage, uh, Ms. Zsofia Balog, project leader from uh, Gustav Busti Center, uh, Ms. Eva Jakab Tóth, research director of the Center for Molecular Biophysics, uh, Mr. Margit Molnár, economist, head of the China desk of the OECD, and uh, Ms. Andrea Somogyi, beamline scientists uh, from uh, Synchrotron Soleil. And uh, Ms. Gabriel Ramos, Assistant Director General, who is kind to moderate this uh, roundtable discussion. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, and let's go into the into the substance right away to, to really extract all of your knowledge. <laughs> may I may I first? Uh, I, I don't want to take a long a long of time introducing each one of you. I w I would like you to introduce yourselves, to say who you are, what you do, and then we go into the round of questions. Please. Hello, I'm Sofia Balog. I'm Hungarian. I was born in Hungary. I finished my studies in Budapest. I'm a molecular biologist. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the Samarvais University. I finished my PhD over there. And then just after two weeks of my uh, defending my thesis, then I found myself in Paris. I had a contract of six months. I, I wanted to go to Barcelona, that, uh, but I found myself in, in Paris. So I was not planning at all to come here. And so it happened in 2010. And then after 12 years, I'm still here. So, and I work actually at the Gustav Rossi Cancer Center. And we are focusing on, on personalized medicine. So we are uh, um, analyzing the uh, patient's molecular profile to advise the best treatment possible. Thank you. So. Um, so, uh, my name is uh, Ivaya Kaptot. Um, I'm a chemist uh, by training. Uh, I also grew up uh, and did my studies in, uh, in Hungary, even my PhD. Uh, after my PhD in chemistry, I moved to, uh, as a postdoc uh, to uh, the University of Lausanne and uh, to the Ecole Poly Polytechnique Federale, where I spent altogether uh, almost 12 years. Uh, 
uh, in uh, 2005, uh, I was recruited at the CNRS as a research director uh, in um, a research institute in, uh, in Orléans, uh, which I also directed uh, for uh, 10 years uh, until the end of uh, 2021. And um, I became uh, just a normal scientist again. And um, so I'm, I'm doing chemistry. My um, field of research concerns uh, uh, the development of, um, of um, imaging agents, uh, mainly for magnetic resonance imaging. This you're doing in which institute? In the Sen Center for Molecular Biophysics, uh, which is a CNRS a research institute. Um. So part of you stayed in France? Yes, yes. Good. That's, that's a good framing. <laughs> to start with, I will mm. ask you what has France to retain this wonderful scientist, Marguerite. You are the, you are the representative of the social and human sciences here. <laughs> good afternoon. Yes, I'm a little bit different from all the others. I'm uh, not a natural sciences scientist, I'm an economist. I've been uh, at the OECD for 22 years already, and um, I'm heading right now the China desk, so mainly working on China, doing the macroeconomic forecast, but also doing uh, structural issues, working on structural issues and making recommendations towards a, f a free market economy. Is that what, what, what we are advocating at the OECD? Um, before coming here, I was living in uh, Tokyo, Japan. That's where I did my PhD, and I worked for the Japanese government on the Asian financial crisis because that's when we were in the middle of um, the crisis uh, when I was uh, finishing my PhD. And before that, um, I also did my master's in uh, Japan and uh, undergraduate in China. Thank you so much, Andrea. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrea Shumagy. I am Hungarian. I finished my studies uh, in Hungary at the University of Debrecen, and I am a physicist. So I am really uh, studying, I was studying a science which is really hardly occupied by uh, men, let's say like this. So I became a physicist because uh, actually it was very funny to, to work with different things, and I had a wonderful teacher who let me in the laboratory after lessons, and I could touch everything, we could explode everything, there was no consequence. And um, actually that was the inspiration that I was really going on to be a physicist. So after the changement of the system in Hungary, I had the possibility and one was the need to, to go abroad to find a, a place to work. So I had already three children at this moment, and we were moving to Belgium. And then from Belgium, I got a proposition in uh, Grenoble, France. And then I got a proposition again next to Paris in uh, Synchrotron Soleil. So just to tell you what I said when we left Hungary, I, want, I wanted to go back at a certain moment. But what we said, I will go everywhere, but not to France. So it was 20 years ago. I am here, and we are happy to be here. And uh, at this moment, I am. I was building a, a beam line. Okay, so this is an instrument with which you can make a lot of uh, beautiful images of a lot of things. For example, cells, and we can see where the medicaments that our colleagues are developing is going, whether the treatment of a, a, a uh, against different diseases like cancer or something else is efficient or not. But also I have wonderful uh, samples. For example, the ancient samples with the first bacteria which have ever existed in Earth. So this is a wonderful job and I am very happy that I wow, did it. Wow, fantastic. Well, I think that this is, this is great. Yes, an applause to our <laughs> fantastic scientists. Uh, and, I, and I feel that we, we can almost start by asking what, what, what is it there in Hungary that produces these fantastic uh, uh, researchers and uh, experts and, and what is it there in France that keeps them? <laughs> let, me, let me start with uh, Marguerite because actually uh, you and I work together uh, at the OECD. As you said, you, you have been one of the top leaders and thinkers uh, on how to advise uh, China. Uh, for the last uh, 20 years uh, on the growth path, on the reforms, and, and many of the, of the decisions I have to say that uh, China has taken uh, based on, on some of the, of, of the advice of Margaret were, were really, really positive. 
Uh, but I want to put the framework uh, on a broader perspective because uh, at the end, uh, what happened in COVID was that women, uh, because of the additional pressures for the care that they are aimed to provide, for the unequal distribution of family cores and of uh, taking care of the elderly or the, or the youngsters, we know that women withdraw from the labor market or were more exposed to burnout. And therefore, there is a decrease of, of labor force participation of women due to COVID and due to this additional burden uh, with the confinements and with COVID. This might be the same in the research area. This might be the same of women researchers that were not able to pursue their own careers. How, how you see that? Do you have uh, uh, analysis, uh, understanding of what was the impact for uh, women researchers, uh, at, I guess, in the OECD uh, world. And then how is that going to affect? Because we know what happens when you don't have women's perspectives in the, in the research that we uh, conduct. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, it's nice to see you in your new function as well. Um, yes, um, uh, COVID was a, a very impactful event. It had uh, impacted all uh, instances of life, and uh, to the extent that often it is called a, a she session or as a, a mom session, what was following, instead of calling it a recession, uh, because of the impact on, on uh, women and especially on working women. We don't have uh, measurable data on it yet, probably at some point uh, that will be available, but uh, obviously, uh, it affected women more than others, uh, but not only women, but also other vulnerable groups. Uh, that is why it's important to include elements in the recovery plans that uh, are addressing these issues. <coughs> that means um, we want countries to include elements in their recovery plans, which not only help economies to recover from this uh, crisis, but also which um, address these long-standing structural issues of inequalities, <coughs> especially discrimination against minority groups, including women. These um, include several aspects. For instance, I will just mention some uh, major ones. Uh, for instance, um, um, in uh, the regulatory area, or uh, it can also cover uh, budgeting, or it can also cover um, public procurement. <clears throat> For instance, in the regulatory area, what is very common and what is already followed by at least 30 OECD countries is a, a gender-oriented assessment, regulatory impact assessment, which is um, it's similar to other, for instance, when you are uh, looking at new regulations, you want to see what is, the, let's say, the competition uh, impact of a, uh, of a certain regulation. Then, in this case, we are looking at what is the gender impact, the potential gender impact. So you, we do this kind of reviews uh, beforehand at the design uh, stage of the regulation and also afterwards at the review stage of the uh, regulation. So this is a, an important element of making sure that uh, women are not affected uh, negatively by any uh, regulation that is in the pipeline. Another um, possibility is uh, budgeting given that uh, money is very important to tackle any kind of uh, structure issue. So um, gender-oriented budgeting is another important tool that we are using. This is less common used. It's uh, in about 17 countries at the moment. Um, and this can, for instance, uh, be incorporated in the performance uh, budgeting system, uh, which is also used in most countries already. A third um, tool is uh, government procurement or public procurement, which is about 12% of GDP uh, on average in OECD countries. So this is also a powerful tool. And the way it works is that, for instance, the government can um, make a condition uh, for government uh, contracts uh, so that uh, companies that have an equal pay policy uh, can only, only those companies that have an equal pay policy can um, <coughs> be awarded those uh, government contracts. For instance, this is the case in uh, Switzerland. So on, only those companies can uh, be awarded government contracts that have such uh, policies. And I would also like to uh, mention some uh, interesting uh, numbers, um, which are not related to the COVID, because uh, as I said, there are not so many new numbers coming after. Uh, we probably are too early. But um, 
some a little bit earlier from earlier ages. What I collected um, is it's very interesting that in the STEM fields, it's very well known that there are much fewer women, and it has been known already for decades. And because of uh, these decades of work um, to solve this issue or to give more opportunities to women, this um, situation has improved and it has significantly improved. For instance, when looking at the number of uh, PhDs that were awarded in the United States, um, in 20 years, it increased 15 percentage points for women in the STEM sciences, in the STEM fields. But Unfortunately, in our field, in economics, um, it's very different. And what is also unfortunate that not so many people realize this. Um, it has, the situation was already worse 20 years ago, and it has not become much better either. So uh, it's only about 30%. It's only about 30% of, uh, uh, of the new PhDs are awarded to women. And it hasn't changed much in 20 years. It's still about 31, 32%. And it's also quite similar in uh, business or management. And that's one of the reasons what, what Gabriela raised in the um, introductory speech, why women are not sitting on the boards or why women are non, not in high positions, just because they are not uh, enough women trained for, the, for these positions. So uh, uh, in business and management, the situation is not, not much better than in economics. So I would just like to uh, raise attention to these uh, numbers because they're not well known. And, and, and the incredible thing, Margrit, is that we always say, where are the women? No? Whenever we are going to uh, announce a position, announce a, a, a possibility, an option, a promotion, where are the women? And at the end, is the nurturing, is the pipeline, is the... Uh, and I have to say that one thing is to have the women because of our own right, and this is about rights, this is a rights discussion. The other part is how much we lose by not having women in economics with their views and in many other fields. And this is where I want to bring Sophia back to the, to the, to the discussion because uh, you have been, uh, now you are the project leader in Gustav uh, Rossi, Rossi Institute uh, and you have been dealing with immunology, with, you have dealing with trials, you have been dealing with many issues and we now know that many of the treatments in, in the um, health field uh, sometimes escape to have more women in the trials because they're difficult in terms of their own monthly cycle and the chances of getting pregnant and then it doesn't make you a good element to be in that trial. This absence of women in the trials yes, goes into yes. misrepresentation of women and then misdiagnostic of women. So I would like you to take us the, the, on that area because I feel that for all of us that believe that we need gender equality, we need to build the arguments of how wrong we can get it yes. by not having the women uh, pursuing this research. So could you so, share yes, with us? Thank you very much. It's a very important uh, question. And so what, what I can say that in our hospital, in the, we have a lot of clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase two, three. And there all these, uh, re I mean, we need international regulations, which are clear that we need equal amount of male and female patients. And so according to that, uh, if it is said at an international level, then they are obliged to, to set up all these studies in this way. And then there is other, uh, also another point when, where we can press or, or make some, some effort uh, in, the, in the question of publication. If you don't do good clinical research, then it's not possible to publish. And you can get grants and you can get support if you have good uh, publications. So if uh, you can apply all these regulations, men and female uh, equal, uh, equality, then uh, I think this is the key. Where, where you can really uh, have uh, the effect later on. And it's not only between man and female, but also comparing different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is also another issue, because if you test all the drugs on, uh, uh, on white, male, on white male, then it won't work in the same way in a, on a, in a black woman. So these are now questions which are really important. And when you publish your, your results, this is also checked by the reviewers, and you can't really publish in a good journal if all these criteria are not respected. So this is, uh, this is very important to set up. But, but do you think that that's something that could be used also to change some of the framing of the, in the scientific research that could favor more women to chip in or, or to prove that, uh, that the outcomes uh, are more balanced, are more 
uh, accurate? Yes. Yes, I think that there, there must be comparative studies and, and to, to show that, yes, indeed, uh, you, uh, I mean, because there are uh, hormonal differences, for, for sure the male don't respond in the same way than female, and so you, ha you have to discover both, both ways of reacting. And, and in your in your research, how do you deal with these things? Have you encountered this? Yes, or? yes, of course. It is it is a very important point, and so all the studies are set at the beginning. That we we say that we need so many people, uh, male people at this uh, gender uh, and this age group, and uh, and so we recruit the patients according to the need. How we set up the uh, at the beginning of starting the protocol, we set up all these criteria, and so this is one of the bases that we have to recruit the patients from both genders. Otherwise, it's not acceptable. So if the, the places for male are already full, then we, uh, we don't recruit more male, but we, we wait so that we can, we can include the female patients. So it, it makes longer, but uh, then you have the results which are uh, better interpretable. Uh, and and I imagine the panel has uh, the more or less the same kind of requirements in your institute, or, or, or how is it different? Uh, Eva. Well, actually, we do not do uh, human research, uh, so. Uh, but okay, uh, you're in the, you're in, the, in the innovation field. Could you could you then move into into this question? Because the fact is that also, uh, uh, gender stereotyping is not only about the mm. disciplines that you choose, but also how innovation is defined. And I was uh, very surprised in the uh, research that we did for the ethics of artificial intelligence. To, to check that some of these AI uh, exercises, whenever you put innovation as a precondition to certain analysis, uh, they send, seldomly mention uh, gender or women. Mm. It was really always, always linked to men. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, do you experience that in terms well, of making your innova innova uh, innovative mm. proposals to be well, uh, recognized? Actually, well, I think um, in the science, it very much depends on the field. Uh, I'm a chemist. Uh, I, I have to say that in our field, uh, women are, uh, I, I would say, quite well recognized. And uh, personally, I never felt any uh, uh, barrier um, to, uh, to progress uh, because I, I was a woman. But uh, this is my personal experience, so maybe I'm not the best uh, example uh, at this uh, audience, but uh, that, that's how, how I feel. Um, on the other hand, I, I recognize that uh, in the physics, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, women are clearly underrepresented. And, and uh, from my point of view, the major reason for this, uh, and probably with this will slowly change with uh, decades uh, and generations, uh, that uh, girls do not have yet the a good model, the role model, uh, which shows that, yes, you can become a mathematician, you can become uh, an expert in artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, you can become uh, you know, whichever you want in any field, uh, because uh, Look, look at these people, and that's why uh, I really um, like this kind of events because uh, this shows that uh, you can be a woman and you can, uh, you can become a physicist, you can become a, a molecular biologist, a chemist, an economist, uh, you can still have a family. Uh, so I think uh, for me, the key point is uh, to show uh, models uh, which uh, um, are real, um, and for us, uh, the key point is to go as close as possible, as you mentioned, uh, the Mexican example, uh, to, uh, uh, to girls and explain them that, uh, look, uh, I was like you, and um, I could become somebody. So um, I think that's uh, probably um, a key point. Let me, let me take you to the more systemic uh, mm -hmm. area. Because it's true that now we have more women in the health sector, more women attracted to uh, uh, chemistry, to health issues, mm. to biology. It, it has been a, a movement uh, in the last uh, five decades, no? That we have more women in these sectors. There has been a deterioration of the conditions in those sectors. The salaries mm. have become down. The recognition of the, of the disciplines have become down. And it happened, and this is an area that we really need to dig down, and uh, Margaret, please, you with the economics, <laughs> take a look at that. Uh, think about education. Education was a male-dominated discipline uh, 100 years ago. Now it's for women. And again, the conditions of the employment and the package has gone down. 
I cannot conclude because I don't have the, the elements to have that conclusion. But, but do you think that this is also, uh, uh, when you populate with more women, no, no, it's less valued. I think uh, I, I would say that uh, some somewhere it's still in the spirit of everybody that uh, uh, so-called female uh, uh, professions are less valued, and uh, somehow it translates into um, financial <laughs> uh, aspects. Uh, so that's uh, I think that's that's probably true. Uh, um, we should we should yeah, take a look. Yeah, probably we should. I work think it's on. super important mm -hmm. because at the end, we, we, with COVID, I I think that these professions, yours. Uh, have become super visible, important, impactful. Uh, but at the end, we, we should take a look at that because one, one thing is the, is the personal experience and another thing is the whole, the whole um, systemic uh, features of, the, of this environment. And, and let me go to, to Andrea because, uh, I, I mean, you, you really, as you, as you mentioned at the beginning, you have been a trailblazer in the world of physics. <laughs> um, and, and I have to say that I, I, I would love to hear from you in a full, a full catheter of this question of the nanoscopium um, beam line. Um, but I also learned that in over 10,000, 100,000 research articles uh, in, in this area, um, there is not great recognition again, as, we, as we've heard with, uh, with Eva, of, of the gender contribution, so women contribution. How do we how do we feature th that also more, in terms of uh, making more visible? And that's why this panel is fantastic because I didn't know you, now I know, and so this we need to all the time demonstrate. This is something that UNESCO also does, bring, bring in these women with the L'Oreal Prize and with the women in size in the in the publication. But the fact is that we need to do more. How do we change this environment in which it's always men who are bringing the most uh, impressive uh, uh, discoveries or more timeline in the news or? Thank you for the question. So I think the physics is the hardest knot in this case uh, because uh, I think there was a paper in Nature saying that in physics only 10% of scientists is, are women, women today. So this is the field where are the more men and the less women. But it's changing, and actually, I don't want to say that I'm not so young anymore, that's not what I'm saying, but still I am seeing this change in my life. So when I started to, to, to become a physicist, I just told my colleagues, at the university there was no place for women, because in Hungary, the guys went to military service, so they were recruited, they were taken to the university, they filled the 20 or 30 places, and there was zero left for a woman. And then I came, and I had maximum points in everywhere, and they wanted to persuade me that, look, it's very difficult to be a physicist. Do you want to be perhaps a teacher? I said, no. Do you want to be something else? You look, there are beautiful things there. I said, no. And I said, but look, there is no place for you. And I said, but look, I had maximum point. I want to be a physicist. So I started like this at the university. And I was the only woman. And uh, how can I say? Uh, what I uh, say that what we can do, just be there. I think we don't have to be guys. I am a woman. I, am a woman. I want to be a woman. I don't want to be another person. I just want to be myself. And I want to insist. So if I think that I'm right, I will tell it. I will tell it kindly, but I will tell it five times, times. And at the end, if you think, if you see that I'm right, you will accept me. And actually, that's something that is happening in my life, in my career. At the beginning, I am there. Most of the time, I am the only woman in a, in a meeting. First time you enter, so what are you doing here? Oh, new colleague. <laughs> okay, so oh, let's tell. You are there, you say something, nobody listens to you. After the fifth meeting, you start to say something and people start to listen. And uh, I remembered for me, the, one of the best things was when one of my colleagues told me that, you know, you don't to talk too much. You have a very low voice, actually. I have a very vo low voice. But when you talk, we want to listen to you because you say something. 
and I was very proud of this. Okay. So actually that's happened, what is happening in, for, with me. And what is very funny, so I just told to my colleagues, the things are changing slowly. So last week I was just the chair of an international advisory committee of a conference, an X-ray microscopy. This conference exists since 20, 25, 30 years. I was the very first chairwoman. I was very proud. And I'm very proud because I had to step off and the two candidates were two women after me. So I said yes, and I told the committee, I am very happy, meaning that I didn't do a very bad job, so you wanted to have another woman after me. And from now on, things are going on naturally. And at the beginning, I was the only woman in the community. So I think that's something very interesting in our field. The other thing that is interesting that we are women, and we have some experience different than the guys, fortunately. We can put things together. So for example, we had, I love to make kitchen. So when you have to fix some samples, you can think about what you are doing in the kitchen. And for example, in our case, the best the uh, thing that we are doing, our wonderful samples, is a nail polish. All of our users are fixing samples with a nail polish. And I'm very proud because of my daughter who gave it to me. And we also know that you never ever should use nail polish which has a color. So it's natural nail polish. So things like this, which are very funny, and people are coming, first they are laughing, and at the end, somehow, you are, they accept you, and and you are advancing like this. And I think this is very important. I want to stay a woman. I am a woman. I don't want to be a man. I want to contribute. I insist. So you cannot put me away just because you are stronger or you have a bigger voice. And I think something. That's, like, that's it. That's, that's a, a fantastic uh, story. Because at the end, just by being, you're open the, opening the door, every one of you. Just by being seen as uh, uh, women that are making a very important contributions, leading institution, leading research centers, being in committees, uh, producing, you, you are really uh, helping change the, the landscape. But I would like to ask each one of you, uh, and then I will, you think about the answer, but then I will go to Margaret again. Uh, is there something else we should be doing than being? Uh, when we have a position of power as women, do we open the door? How do we open the door to others? How do we very, very concretely, because what we want to, what we want to have is, um, and I see that, uh, that Sophia wants to chip in, and so I will let you do that, but then I want to ask, I want to, uh, Magritte to start thinking. No, no, you, 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 you answer that question because you really want to answer it, and that's fantastic. Also with passion, passion is important in women. Uh, Magritte, think about, because you said it at the beginning, how do we first role models, fantastic, you go, you stay, and then people start appreciating, and then they, you break the, 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 these stereotypes that women have nothing to contribute, you contribute. Second, you now have leadership position, how you uh, help others to come institutionally, systematically, more than just by the experience of living. And then Magritte, we know that more and more uh, is recognized that uh, women in the media, whenever we're talking about scientific uh, discussions, uh, in the COVID case, what happened is that women were, were called as a witness or as victims of COVID, and men were called more as experts. In the general public, we're not talking about scientific research. And therefore, how, from the economics perspective, we can bring the evidence of how much having women in these committees helped the outcomes. The, there are some analyses in the financial uh, research, but it will be great to have it because the fact is that the committees that deal with COVID, really women were underrepresented massively too. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to say what is possible to do at a personal level. So I was a, a teaching biology for undergraduate students. 
And what I organized each year for my group is to visit the laboratory, to come and see how is it a sample, to look into the microscope, to, to talk about the co uh, together with the colleagues, with the technician, to see that in the, how is the life in the laboratory. Because I think this is always something which is closed. There is always the markets forbidden, don't touch to anything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something hidden. And this is what I really needed when I was a child, to, to see how is the life in the lab. And so this is what I offer to my students. <coughs> and then they were so happy that they also told to their other uh, friends around and so th we had a, a second tour because uh, they really loved it to to come and see and discover uh, what we see in the microscope and they had a lot of questions and so they were really in the situation to to see the real life but but you're bringing this a story because it happened because of you with being a woman or because, why? Uh, yeah because I was I was their teacher and so I saw that it is also important to uh, because it was an international school so I had uh, students from Iran from wherever from all over the world and, uh, and they were close yes and so they they didn't know I mean they were not really sure about if they are good enough if it's possible for them or you know there are a lot of restrictions but then they they could come and and visit and and they they could see that yes it's it's possible also for girls it's not uh, not uh, only for boys and so they they really uh, liked it leading by example eva your experience uh, I, I also uh, want to follow on this because i think uh, uh, women have much more inhibition uh, they, they are much less uh, self confident and and uh, i think our uh, role is also to uh, tell them that uh, you have to uh, you have to try and you will succeed and um, I, yeah, I, I'm really um, sure about this, that uh, uh, when you have uh, the same population of men and, uh, and uh, women, uh, men will go much easier forward. And, and uh, although they, they are just as good as, as women, but uh, it's, it's also our, uh, I think sometimes we have to change. Uh, we, have, we have also uh, have to see ourselves differently. And, um, it, yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's, very, it's very well documented and I think that this is interesting because uh, in, on the one hand we want our girls to be more self-confident, mm -hmm. which is not usual practice and I have to say it is not usual practice in, in many countries in the world in the sense of how much we instill this self-confidence on, on the capacities of girls to, no? even teachers saying, well, girls are no, not good at maths or that's not for girls immediately needed the level of ambition and this has been documented by, by UNESCO, by the OECD, how much the, 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 the level of ambition that we put for girls in the school performance uh, also impinges in their own, in their own, in their own outcomes. Uh, that might be a very interesting source of uh, scientific uh, contribution because you don't have all the answers and you bring more questions and you bring probably more solid ways of dealing the scientific evidence, which is interesting, but still, I feel that uh, girls need the chance to uh, feel more empowered. How, how do you, you, you mentioned your own um, leading by example kind of uh, breaking the mold, uh, but I want to get into the systemic issues and, and how do we, you, because we are going to hear from you, how do we do it a rule? not a, an experience, a rule to, to encourage more women, to bring more women, to have more women in the teams, in the research, in the... Mm -hmm. So, um, I think what is very important uh, to, to recognize that at our generation, there is a certain percentage of women and men. I think one thing in my field, it is very dangerous to do, to overestimate, uh, over force the percentage of women in a committee over representative than it is in the scientific field. So for me, to enter a woman somewhere just because you are a woman, you don't want to do it. So I think this is one thing, it's very important. So you will not go for quotas or affirmative no. action or targets? No, no, no. no Why? No. Because uh, it's somehow degrading for me and also, it gives the right to the others to say you get there be only because you are a woman. And that I don't want. I want to be the representative of the quota which exists today. But 
So 10% today, let's accept it. But I don't there is a quota of 20% that does no, not have no, a quota. No, there is no me. quota. But for example, <laughs> in the. No, no. The, no, no. 10% no, no. is the reality in yeah. physics in my generation. So don't push 50% to have 50% of women of my age because it's not true. This is not a reality. But do not accept that it stays like this. So for me, the change is coming with the generation. And I think we have a very important role in this to accept women in our laboratory. Also, how we educate our children. So for example, if you have a daughter, your daughter is important, so she can be whatever she wants. If you have students, so actually at our Institute Soleil, we have a lot of visitors, and it's very nice to, to discuss with them and show them what you are doing in a, in a natural way. Say, Look, I am like you, you can be like me, it's not, it's, it's not so difficult. And I think what we are not talking a lot, there is education. Education is extremely important. I think from the primary school, even below, women, uh, girls and boys should play the same games if they want. By a, by a, a doll for your, for your boy, why not? by Lego for your girls. Why there is a difference and why we are keeping this difference uh, long uh, from the beginning, uh, which arrives to a certain moment, there is a separation between the two gender naturally. And I think we are not talking a lot of, about this, but as you said, this is very, very cultural, which we have to, we have to break from the beginning. I, I, I have to say, um, Andrea, that um, I, I'm not sure about the, the, the affirmative action and the, and the quotas. I think that we have a problem at the top and a problem at the, at the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, if we just wait for this uh, natural movement in terms of proving how important the contributions of women can make, it will take years. Uh, when I was chief of staff at the OECD, I decided that, that every single recruitment had to put uh, half women, half men. Just recruitment. I mean, I was not uh, mentioning the outcome. I was just saying I want every single recruitment of every manager that comes to me to give me five women and five men, four women, four men. And you know how many managers would come and say, seven men, three women, there are no women. And then I would say, okay, there are no women, give me three, three men and three women then to comply with this rule that we establish of half and half. They found the women. <laughs> oh, I, yes, there was another seven that I found. Like, I think that the, because the fact is that there's lots of cultural and institutional norms, social norms, that blind us from the absence of women in this in this end. So, so the, the, the affirmative action, the targets, many times help us to unveil and take away the the, the lack of, of visibility of there are no women. So, uh, can I con <coughs> just? Uh, I, yeah, I think you are right in certain fields. I think in other fields, it's really not. You cannot do it so strictly. So, if because you there are no women. There is not 50% women. So you can push a little bit, but I know several examples Then uh, there was 50%, 50%. It's a very strict rule in France, actually. And at the end, we had, okay, give us a name. It doesn't matter. We have to have the 50%. I, I know it from personal experience. So I think I agree with you. You have to push. But to have a strict quota when okay. you cannot have it, I think it is a contradictory. Uh, I will have Eva and, uh, and Sophia to, to tell us on that, but I want to bring Marit because I, I want you to, to tell them why it is important to have women in the committee <laughs> in terms from the economics perspective. Well, uh, there is empirical evidence that diversity brings better results. I mean, it, it's very clear that if uh, there are people from different backgrounds, I mean, including also men and women, but also including different minorities, people from different cultural backgrounds, from different professional backgrounds, then uh, there will be more ideas. There will be more innovation. 
and at the end there will be better outcomes. So th that's uh, empirically uh, proved, so that there is no question about that, but the question is how to achieve that. And that's uh, why we are now working on uh, these tools that some of which are mentioned, like this uh, regulatory impact assessment should include uh, an aspect of uh, gender. So whatever regulation the uh, government is planning to introduce, they should be beforehand uh, an impact analysis of what would be the impact on, on women of this regulation. So, and that was just one of the uh, many, many other tools. So we should find the right tools to make sure that women have uh, equal chance. So first of all, that would solve the missing woman problem. But then there is also the other uh, issue, which we, I think we haven't talked about yet, which is the pay issue. Um, which is, uh, <clears throat> for instance, um, I uh, remember only four doctors. Um, you also cited that in Hungary, 53% uh, of doctors are women, and that's about the same as the European average. In other continents, um, it would be much worse, in, especially on the African continent, it would be only slightly above 30%. But what is, what is worse than that is not only that, uh, okay, women are above uh, 50%, so it's okay. It's not okay, but because when you look at their pay, mm -hmm. so when you look at the distribution of uh, the pay uh, of female doctors, then you would see that there's a huge difference. So there's half a chance of a woman to be in the highest income percentile than for a man, if they, if they are a doctor. So that's what is striking, and that's what uh, the other aspect that we should also tackle. It's not only the missing women, but also the underpaid women. As, as we said at the beginning, and I think that will be a fantastic topic for UNESCO and the OECD to research the sectors and how they, the, this uh, re reduction and attractiveness of certain conditions of work in some sectors. But, but you both want to talk about uh, quotas, not quotas, well, affirmative action. Well, actually, affirmative. Uh, just one word about quotas, because uh, I understand what uh, Andrea is saying. Uh, actually, I had uh, several times the remark that it's easy for you because you are a woman, and this is the woman's uh, era now, and uh, so you, you can go f faster because uh, you have some favored uh, you know, uh, um, position. So I think, why, why would that bother you? Well, you know, because you want to achieve uh, uh, everything um, according to your quality and according to what you are really versed and not because uh, you are a woman. You, you see what, what I mean? Because uh, um, when in our uh, area, when, when you write a publication, I, I want to uh, get recognition for the value of this, uh, uh, this uh, scientific work, work and not uh, because uh, I'm a woman. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, but let, that's me, true. let me just be provocative but, yes. because because mm. you are the the, the science and, and I'm just always a gender mm. uh, equality <laughs> a champion. Uh, you are talking about your own personal experience and the way some men might be framing the fact that there needs to be affirmative action for leveling the playing field, and then they turn at it against you because oh because you're a woman. Hmm. Well, at the end, is the system that will never change if we don't have these tools. That they, I'm not hmm. saying because I I, I I I I rather do not comment on the scientific field. Uh, I help my country to get a quota in the Congress, hmm. and I and I've heard the president of the Congress telling me that we were going to be full of incompetent women. I was like, wow, hmm. you know, we're full of incompetent men without a quota. I mean, well, I think it's uh, like. <laughs> will not change anything. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. the, fact, the fact is that I feel that how could I make the point that we need those tools independently of how you feel personally, systemically, it is proven that whenever there are this level playing field kind of measures, it works. Well, I think uh, it's important, for example, to have uh, quotas. Uh, uh, when you uh, recruit uh, young scientists, it's, uh, it's absolutely important uh, to set 50-50% uh, uh, quotas. Uh, but uh, uh, not in, uh, in certain committees uh, where uh, um, we know that uh, women are underrepresented uh, in terms of numbers uh, in that population where that committee has to come from. And uh, then uh, those who are finally elected into the committee uh, will never uh, be able to remove from them their mind that uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's how it is because... Uh, let's, let's give the, 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 the floor to Sophia. Yes. Oh, no, the, don't don't okay. escape the okay. question. <laughs> Where you stand on this question of... Uh, 
So I think affirmative action, not affirmative action. Where do you put it? How? Because at the end, I as I said, sometimes it helps you fix the leaky pipeline. So it's difficult because in in biology or in in, in medicine there are more more women okay. at the beginning, okay. but then after when you look at the progression. higher the progression, then they they fell off. And uh, I think the one reason is because they, they just start their family. And so there are a couple of years when they are just not, not active. They don't publish. They don't have impact factors. And so when you want to be a head of department, that's the first thing that they ask. So how, how many publications do you have, uh, the grants? Uh, so I mean, you are just like you, you have lost, uh, I don't know, uh, depending on the number of, of children. But you lost uh, maybe two, four, six, uh, how many years? And so that's why the guys, they, I mean, the, 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 they, they just, um, I mean, if they were already on the curb, they just continue. They don't yeah. do an, any extra. Even if they have children, they go home, uh, but, but their curve is, is increasing. But, but the, the women, they, they really get off from the work. And uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to be a woman, to have children, and to publish at the and, same and time. And that's, that's the source of the whole thing, the redistribution of uh, non-paid work. But, but let me, I, I, I just want to, to, to hear from the public if you have any question, because we have a, a little bit more than 10 minutes to close the discussion. Uh, a little bit more, the ambassador is telling us. Um, uh, let me tell you, the, 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 uh, two weeks ago I, I was at, at the conference on social and human sciences. And there was this Argentinian researcher who told me that um, she w applied to a, a foundation in Germany to, for one of her papers. And, and she saw that the, deadline, the, the age limit was 30 years old. And then she put her name, but she said, oh no, but I can't because I'm 23 or 24. And, and the foundation <coughs> told her, uh, do you have children? And, and she said, yes, I have two. OK, we take two years off. I mean. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, I'm telling you some of the, some of the, because what happens first and foremost is that you all and we all mm -hmm. have different conditions because of the cultural norms. These kind of interventions. And yeah, this, uh, this how it goes. Uh, I uh, do not want to defend my institution, which is CNRS, which is the uh, uh, French uh, National uh, Research um, um, well, uh, Institute, and uh, I'm in a committee of CNRS, uh, which uh, recruits uh, uh, young scientists. And actually, we have this rule. We have to respect this rule. Uh, so one kid counts uh, for, a, or uh, actually, uh, every uh, candidate has to declare how many months uh, she spent on uh, maternity leave and this is just counted off uh, uh, her age. So that's how, how it works and I think that's, that's normal. Yes, this is uh, in France, this is usual practice now. Excellent. So uh, perhaps one thing, I think what I would love to have, uh, to have blind application. Why should you know whether I am a guy or a, a woman? Good. Good. I, actually, this is my point. That's okay. what we would, I would like to have equal chance. And, and this is fantastic because you know there is uh, Iris Bonnet, I don't know if you have heard of her. She runs the Center for Gender Equality in, in the Kennedy School in Harvard. And she was the one that, uh, is, is, she's conducting a, a lot of behavioral uh, studies on gender. And, and this is the one that conducted this exercise of doing auditions for musicians with a curtain. And comparing what happened when there is a curtain and you cannot see who is performing and, and then with the people seeing who's performing, and there was 30% yeah. <coughs> increase of women musicians being hired for the, for the play and wow. for, so, so these are the kind of things, so, so I think that we agree. Any question from the public? I mean, you have the chance to, Ambassador. Yes. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the Swiss representative, Swiss permanent delegate to UNESCO. Well, first, thank you for inviting and for this vibrant uh, uh, panel. Thank you so much. I'm very much inspired by Vilma Hugonai, and I was so delighted to discover that she studied in Zurich. <laughs> and uh, I, I tried to find out, and at the end, it, it appeared that actually Zurich University was very liberal at that time comparing to all other universities in Europe. That's why 
she could study there. Uh, but I'm also delighted to see that Switzerland remains very attractive for scientists. And because I heard you have studied in the School of Technology in Lausanne, which is very high level, and so congratulations. And well, by listening to you, I didn't have the impression that your situation is very much different of, of mine. I'm not a scientist, I'm a diplomat, but uh, I, I must say that maybe naively I thought that because you are in science and you are, your work is based on facts and figures, very objective results, maybe it would be more difficult to enter because maybe girls were less attracted to it, but once you are inside, you know, you can prove by your results that you are just as good as other ones, but apparently it's not so easy. And uh, well, I could share everything what you have said, and just to comment on this issue about uh, in general, uh, men telling you, you are here because you are a woman. I mean, they were here because they were men during <laughs> hundreds of years. So why, why not? And it's, I think it's just a part of the, the struggle. I, had, I listened to so many colleagues, uh, people, men, applying for positions and commenting, well, now you know if you are a man and a white man, it's forget about it, you have to be a woman. Just, you know, <laughs> with this tone that anyway, they will hire a woman just because she's a woman. Well, let, the, let them talk. I'm sure we have enough opportunities. You have more than enough opportunities to prove that you're just as good or probably better. So, yes, <laughs> thank you. So a point where you... <laughs> A point of not be shy to take advantage of some of the of the practices that we have uh, advanced on this on this front. Um, the the fact is that uh, I want to hear from you fi finally, and thank you, Ambassador, because actually it's true Switzerland has uh, is attracting uh, scientists. But I want to thank the ambassador because she helped the uh, the social and human science sector of UNESCO to establish an observatory on women and sport. Because every sector you go, you find the wage gaps, the representation gaps, the time gaps, because if we lack something, it's uh, enough time to deal with our career. So, so thank you, Ambassador. Uh, f final comment, and, and, and we will close from each one of you. Um, are you a champion for women in your own institutions? Would you be a champion for women? If you got uh, if you got a decision making position, some of you already have. What do you mean by that? To be a champion? promoting women, promoting oh, women to, to to take the positions, yes. promoting women, promoting the system. Yes. I think that's the point, that a woman never wants to be a champion, you know? This, uh, champion for women? Ch champion Or champion for in general? <laughs> yes, champion in general, in, in, in their uh, work, you know? Over to Men. you. Have you promoted women? Of course. Uh, Very of straightforward. Course I, I have, uh, um, yeah, I, I encourage women uh, very, uh, uh, very often, all, all the time. Uh, I have uh, young colleagues who are women uh, who uh, I try to prepare to take uh, positions uh, by sharing my own experience, uh, by helping them. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, in my uh, research group, uh, there are uh, three younger uh, scientists, uh, and um, I uh, deliberately prepare them uh, to, uh, to take uh, responsibilities, and, and uh, I, uh, I try to guide them. Uh, uh, so uh, that's that's what I I, I can do. Um, uh, but uh, I think um, yeah, we we also we have to treat everybody equally, and uh, we do not have to uh, uh, you know uh, as in Hungary we say uh, um, fall on the other side of the horse. Uh, uh, 
uh, because uh, I think uh, this will be bad for us, this will be bad for everybody. Uh, this, uh, the day when we will not talk about this question uh, will be the, um, I think, uh, the achievement. And, and the in, your, in, your, in your institution, uh, is there uh, equality in terms of the managerial positions? Um, On the top decision makers? Well, uh, I, uh, if uh, there is an equality, well, actually, um, so there is a director. Uh, actually, I was the first director, uh, woman director of this institute, uh, uh, so uh, which was created in uh, in '67, and uh, so I became director in 2012. Uh, I was relatively young at that age, and so I was uh, the youngest, uh, the first uh, woman. And um, so there is no uh, equality uh, rule, but uh, there are, in, we are chemists, uh, biologists, some physicists, uh, uh, so I have a lot of uh, female uh, colleagues and uh, it's more or less equal, I would say, uh, at the decision level, so. Andrea, do you want to comment? Yeah, so for sure we, we are promoting women, but uh, in an equal basis. But in my group, uh, I would say at least 50% of the students and the colleagues are always women or more. It depends whether there are. And uh, Sola is, uh, yeah, there are quite a lot of women. And uh, yeah, one director is a woman and the other is, yeah, it's, it's quite equal. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe if I can just say uh, <laughs> She, I don't want to, but I think promoting women, it's also uh, promoting men to take over uh, some, um, um, like a women's job at home. And I can tell you that, uh, for example, I have a, a, a young uh, postdoctoral uh, a student uh, who's a man, and uh, so they had just uh, had a baby a few months ago, and uh, when he tells me that uh, I have to uh, take my kid to the, uh, to the pediatrician or the, the doctor, uh, I tell him that, okay, yes, uh, stay home, uh, um, one day of uh, homework. Uh, and um, so I think that's also um, very, yeah, very, showing very everybody important. that, uh, yes, let's very, share. Uh, very important, uh, very important. Uh, you wanted to say something, Sophia, and, and then we will close with Margrit. Um, a general comment on the economics field, and uh, uh, yes, uh, Sofia. So, um, in our group, uh, we are a group of, of ten, and there is only one male. So uh, oh, no, we, we, we need we, the balance. <laughs> Sorry, the balance. President. <laughs> but it, I'm, I was not choosing, but I mean, it was naturally like that. But we protect this poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> surrounded all these uh, chickens with care, <laughs> <Yes>. care, and <laughs> support. Yes, Margaret. Do you want to hear about the OECD, uh, the insider? In the economics, in the economics. you are in, in the general. economics, and I think that you yourself, and I have to say, and I will say it by, by closing, that each one of you, just by the, the career path that you chose, you are promoting women. <laughs> so, so that's a fact, but uh, in the economic field, you, you started saying that it was also not uh, showing a lot of progress, and it's true, because you still see the finance uh, ministerial is always a very great suit kind of thing. Yes, so there is a, a wide range of research about this, about all the, all the aspects of why there are so few women uh, economists and uh, why is their pay is lower. I mean, uh, but we still don't have a, a good enough database that is internationally comparable. So that's, for instance, what we could do and uh, probably also jointly with uh, UNESCO to set up a database by profession and also by pay and so that we can uh, conduct analysis about what are actually the underlying reasons of unequal pay. So we could control for, the, for instance, um, um, I just mentioned before uh, the example of doctors um, that there is a pay gap. Um, I think I didn't mention that the pay gap is 11%, even after all the other factors are being controlled for. For instance, after controlling for the uh, different specialization within the medical field and also controlling for the, the time, because part-time workers obviously earn less. But even after controlling for all these different factors, what still remained is still about uh, 11%. So we still need to conduct studies about why is this 11% in this case in the field of doctors um, still persists. And for that, we need good enough data, which don't exist at this point. And uh, well, for that, UNESCO has a uh, very good uh, local representation all around the world. And it also has um, a very good um, 
range of reference countries. Um, and those are usually um, not in every area very uh, relevant for best practices, but in this particular area, they are very much relevant. I was just uh, mentioning it to my colleagues that uh, in the area of economics, in terms of publications, those uh, countries that are in the Western Balkans, uh, they perform much better than any other OECD country in terms of the percentage of female economists who are publishing. I looked at the Ideas Repack database, which is the, the biggest database for uh, economists uh, for publishing. And um, in Bulgaria, uh, North Macedonia, uh, Romania, Croatia, uh, women um, make up more than 50%, between 50 and 55% of all uh, economists who are publishing. So, and these countries are not OECD countries. So that's why I'm saying that the best practices are not always found within the OECD, or although very often, yes, but not always. So that's why it's, uh, it could be, um, th there could be synergies to be uh, realized if uh, we collaborate on, on many areas. No, well, we'll be happy to, to, to join the doing this uh, research because uh, UNESCO has been really tracking women in size for so many years. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned because in Latin America we have also the highest rate in Brazil and Mexico of women choosing STEM as discipline. Uh, but then the, the passage through the, through the studies to the labor market is just a lost uh, of all the t many of the talents because the environment is really not really very, very greatly uh, women uh, friendly. But in any case, it has been a fantastic conversation. I have learned from you. <laughs> I, I have uh, listened exactly where you feel where you feel you can make a contribution. Uh, as in the case of the of the uh, fantastic Ugonier uh, women that we are celebrating today, uh, you are just trailblazers because you are there. You are publishing quality outcomes, and, and you are talking and presenting and being seen, and, then, and that helps a lot, and so it, it has been my pleasure to, to talk to you. Um, I will continue, of course, because I have been dealing with this gender agenda for quite some time, and, and listening to these uh, intricacies of every discipline, of every sector, of every, which cannot have just one size fits all. But at the end, we all recognize that we need all these modes of intervention to ensure that there is ample space for women to contribute to whatever area they want to uh, participate. So, Ambassador, with this, uh, we just finished the panel. If we give a, a, a very great uh, applause to our speakers. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been indeed a very interesting, insightful, and uh, an inspirational uh, conversation. And thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, my task is to give some concluding remarks, uh, which uh, I will do it very quickly. Uh, maybe only three uh, elements of uh, conclusion, uh, maybe. The one thing is that uh, there has been indeed lots of progress uh, in the area of uh, equality, gender equality, in, in, in the area of science. The uh, good news is that uh, women do not need to go to Switzerland for university studies, studies uh, anymore. They are free to go to university in Hungary, uh, at least from a from European perspective. And then do not forget that uh, the world is not Europe only. Um, but from a European perspective, uh, uh, women are free to choose the scientific career. Uh, and uh, there are many uh, female scientists, excellent uh, female scientists, who set the example. And some of those are sitting here on stage. And once again, it's my privilege to share the stage uh, uh, with you. My second conclusion is that uh, despite uh, this huge progress that has been made since, uh, since the area of, uh, of, of Vilma Hugonai, uh, this progress has been, uh, let's say, gradual, slow, only partial. Uh, still a lot to do, still a long way uh, to go. Uh, they're on, on, on the same road. Uh, women are still underrepresented in many areas of science, in STEM education. Uh, women are still uh, not well recognized or, or under recognized in, in some areas of science. 
And still, there are lots of stereotypes uh, in our own minds uh, when it comes to, to women's uh, contribution to various areas of life, but including uh, uh, sciences in particular uh, today. Uh, and third, uh, and this has been, I think, the basic question of, of today's uh, conversation is uh, how we can, what we can do uh, to, to pursue this change, uh, to, to accelerate uh, this, uh, this, this progress, uh, to change the situation. And uh, I think uh, that, uh, that you sitting on, on, on stage, you have done your part. Uh, and I think it is, uh, it is up to us, up to the rest of us, uh, to, to do the rest, uh, to, to let us change our minds, uh, to let us uh, sort of tear down the stereotypes and, uh, and to be open uh, for, uh, for, 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 for following the outstanding example that many female scientists uh, have set uh, to us. We have heard a number of very interesting uh, policy advice uh, from an economist's point of view, what, uh, what policies can do to, to, to help the issue when it comes to, to regulatory policy or, or, or other, other areas of, uh, of, of, of policies. We have heard uh, uh, the crucial importance of education play, play, place uh, in, in this area, early childhood education and, and, and school education. And uh, let us not forget that it is up to us how we raise our children, uh, because as time goes by, uh, things will change. Uh, sometimes change are slow, and, and, uh, but it is, it is it's up to us how we, how we raise the next uh, generation, how open-minded uh, and how how, how eager and how, how, how flexible to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be self-natural uh, that, uh, that anyone can contribute to any area of life uh, independent of, 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 of their of, of the gender. So I, I think uh, uh, this has been uh, what, uh, what I wanted to share with you as uh, sort of concluding remarks. Uh, all but is... Uh, is, uh, is, is left to do is to thank you again for the panelists, for the moderator, for your excellent contributions today. Thank you, very inspire, inspiring conversation. Thank you for the audience, for the interest and, and the patient, uh, be it uh, physically sitting here, or th thank you for those of you who are following this uh, event uh, online as well. And uh, thank you for the List Institution uh, for hosting us and for, uh, for, uh, for the infrastructure, for, for the online broadcast of this event. And finally, uh, I, I, want, I just want to remind you all that you are kindly invited uh, to join us downstairs uh, for the standing reception uh, tonight. Thank you very much again. Uh, good night. And see you later downstairs. Thank you.